Good evening, everybody. My name is Chido Chashe Nicolette Nure, and today we're here with a discussion on mobile money, uh, particularly the revolution in Africa with case studies from Kenya and Zimbabwe. So before I dive into the discussion uh, or give an introduction, I'm going to give it to the panelists. Today we have got uh, Hilary, Kud Hilary Musa, who's from Zimbabwe, and Natasha Mwangi, who's, who's from Kenya. So I'm going to start with Hillary and then move to Natasha. May you guys introduce yourselves to the public, who you are, what you're doing. Um, yeah, then we can have the discussion. Uh, thank you, Chido. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Hilary Kuzanai Muza. I'm an admitted attorney of the Superior Courts of Zimbabwe. I specialize in commercial and civil litigation, labor law and arbitration. Uh, my practice ha has brought me in touch somewhat with uh, mobile money transactions in that I've dealt with certain aspects of taxable income, which relates to, to, to mobile money transactions as well. So I've come across it time and again. So this is an interesting topic for me to be engaged in, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much, Hilary. Uh, Natasha? Thank you so much, Shido. Hi, everyone. Um, Natasha Mwangi, uh, Tax Associate at Deloitte & Touche. My interaction with mobile money has mostly been as a consumer and overall curious person. Uh, well, I'm just going to say, guys, thank you for being here. I'm so excited to have you. So we are going to be talking about mobile money revolution, which is basically going to be a build-up conversation that we have we had last week, which was mainly focused on uh, in Africa. And we noted from the discussion that a lot, uh, some of the responses that we're getting from the panelists were mainly focused on the revolution or the evolution of mobile money, especially within the southern and the eastern African communities. According to the World, uh, World Economic Forum, the use of mobile money has grown exponentially over the past 10 years, making the region the global leader in mobile money um, innovation, adoption, and usage. And this was in particular reference to Tesla, which is uh, a Kenyan product. Then we also have Zimbabwe, having gone through a process of um, high inflation rate, uh, moving into a cashless society, and we have one of the telecom companies, which is Ecomit, coming up with a mobile money product uh, called EcoCash, which basically saves, if not 95% of the population. So I'm going to pose this question to uh, Natasha. How does mobile money operate in your country? How is it received and sent to different people? And I want you to give a response that is as, as practical as possible, given that your interaction with mobile money has mainly been on the uh, from the point of a, an end user, not a regulator or um, an innovator. So over to you, Natasha. Um, just to be clear, you want a, you want me to describe how you put money yes. in and take it out, right? Yes, the the whole process. Because my understanding is, uh, with most of other countries, especially from the West African communities and Northern African communities, they have no idea of what mobile money is all about. And I would say that even here in South Africa, people have a distorted view of what mobile money is and how it works. They almost think that credit. Uh, you know, your credit cards and all these other things, they still form part of mobile money. So maybe just given an appraisal of your understanding of mobile money, uh, how Mpesa works and how it's been performing in Kenya. All right. So I'm going to give that answer in, I think, two sections. As an Mpesa agent and as an Mpesa customer, that is the person you go to take your money too so they can update your balance and then what happens to you once you go there. So we'll start from the side of the consumer, right? So we are assuming that you want to put in some money, you want to have a money balance on your phone. So you walk to an a certified M-Pesa agent, you give them your money, and then, so they need a few details to verify that the money is really going to you. So they need your phone number and they need your ID number, right? So you're going to give them those details. 
they'll put them in. They have gadgets. They basically have phones and particular telephone lines or SIM cards that are specifically for M-Pesa agents. So they'll put in your details, you'll give them your money, and then you'll receive a notification from M-Pesa that your account balance has gone up by the amount you are depositing at the agents, right? So in that situation, now what happens on the agent's side is that when you go to them and you want to deposit money onto your phone number, they have they need to have a particular balance on their SIM card, on their telephone line. So you're going to go and deposit 2,000 bob. Once you give them the 2,000 bob, the balance on their SIM card goes down by an equivalent amount. So at all times, basically, if you're putting in money at an M-Pesa agent to your phone number, once they receive their cash, their, we call it a float, their float on their telephone number goes down. I don't know whether that's clear, Chido. That's very clear. Thank you so much, Natasha. Hilary, I'm going to come to you and pose the same question, but slightly from a different perspective. So... I don't want you to necessarily explain to us how mobile money works in Zoom, but maybe can you give us an an idea of how we got to mobile money in Zimbabwe, the evolution, uh, what led to that, and how has it been operating since? Okay, thank you for the question. So, um, to use to use Natasha's words in answering your question, uh, she describes a mobile money transaction as money being put into your SIM card. So there's a, immediately there's a distinction between money in your phone and money in your bank account. So where mobile the mo- mobile money revolution started in Zimbabwe is we have or we had at the time that Econet came in, which is around September 2011, we had a multi currency system where we were using the pula, the rand, uh, the Chinese yen together with the uh, uh, with the United States dollar. So as you may be aware, we have uh, been facing uh, challenges as an economy. And one of the results of that, of those challenges is that cash has and always has been in short supply. So where mobile money comes in is you don't need cash to transact. It's a paperless way of, of buying and selling whereby, as Natasha described, money is sent to and from your phone. And the other advantage of, um, of, of mobile money is that you don't need a bank account. So you'll note that in Zimbabwe, and I guess this is the same for Africa, bank accounts are held by less than 20 to 30% of the population generally. And this is in juxtaposition to the West where you have 92 to 95% of, of, of the population having bank accounts. So this explains the traction that mobile money had. It's easy. You have your phone, you go to an agent, you take money out, you go to a shop, you pay using it, and it got to the point where, you know, services were being added on. So you could pay for your electricity, you could pay for school fees, you could pay for all sorts of um, expenses and bills and utilities. So it's grown from strength to strength. But the basis of it is that it's, it's formed on the basis of not having a system where you rely on cash. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, you have. Thank you so much. Uh, what I, I just to confirm this, what Hillary is saying is actually very true. It got to a point where uh, cash became something that was so foreign to most Zimbabweans who were just transacting with mobile money, from paying for your school fees to buying a plate of, of uh, lunch or we usually call it that as well at 1 p.m. That's how it was. So maybe to get a different perspective from Natasha. We, really led or fueled the growth of mobile money in Kenya. Because from my understanding, the Zimbabwean perspective was mainly based on the fact that there was a lot of economic instability that led to, you know, high inflation rates and a multi-currency system that culminated into uh, Zimbabwe becoming a cashless society. Mobile money then came in more with this savior complex or mentality to save people from just, you know, going downhill. So what really led to uh, the proliferation of agents and the acceptance of mobile money in Kenya. Natasha. 
Um, that's a really interesting question because I believe while the reasons might be different from Zimbabwe, the moti- well, not really the motivations, the end result has been the same. I think most people just wanted accessibility in a country where for the longest part, bank accounts were considered elite services, like having a bank account was a really, you know, prestigious, quote unquote, thing. And these weren't things that were easily accessible. But at the same time, people wanted to have the convenience of being able to share resources, of being able to, you know, send money to somebody who is far away from you without having to trust a a courier or a random matatu driver and just cross your fingers and hope they deliver your money. So, you know, just that knowing that you would like to be able to transact with convenience, you know, from wherever you are, just that was the biggest motivation. Wow. Uh, interesting. So I, I think when we start looking at the issue of financial inclusion from a, from an African perspective, we can definitely say mobile money has really been the key player in in ensuring that the historically excluded become financially included. Um, I'm going to ask you, Hilary, to, to, to tell us of the challenges that you have uh, sort of made experience with your use of mobile money in, in Zimbabwe. I, I know that we have been talking about the positive aspects. Of, so wh- what are the concerns that are there generally when we start talking about mobile money? Okay. The first concern uh, that that people raise, by and large in Zimbabwe, is that the cost of transacting is is a bit high. And I say this on the on the background of there being a monopoly enjoyed by Econet uh, with its eco, eco cash service. So there are four competitors, there are four players in the market. There's eco cash, there's one money, there's telecash, and then there's my cash. And these four compete against another service that's called uh, ZimSwitch or ZipIt. So what happens is Econet enjoys, like you said before, about a 95% monopoly. monopoly. I'm not sure of the figure, but it's very, very high. And what that causes is that the cost of transacting is dictated by Eco, Eco, Econet because they've got the subscriber base and they've got the machinery to, to, to make things work. And this capacity isn't enjoyed by the other players on the market. So due to that monopoly, you know, costs can go up and there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, for, for, for interest sake, it's actually cheaper to transfer money from a bank account to another bank account than it is to send uh, eco cash to another eco cash account. So that's one of the impediments we, we come across. And also from a regulatory standpoint, uh, I'll take you back to, is it July last year when the Reserve Bank in its, um, regulatory role uh, shut down a number of eco cash merchants so that meant that we couldn't transact we couldn't receive money we couldn't pay for anything it meant that up to 50,000 uh, merchants were, were just shut down just like that so it, it, it's really unpredictable when when you look at it from a policy standpoint we don't know what can happen on any given day we, we may just come up with wake up with a policy in, in position that says you can't transact. Yeah, so I, I would say those are the two main impediments from, from my point. Well, thank you so much. I, I actually came across the, the notice by the Reserve Bank and it came as a shock also that had um, an implication on a lot of people, particularly. I mean, everybody keeps money in equity. So, Natasha, maybe if you can tell us about the, the same changes, but as you indicated earlier in your introduction, you work as a tech expert. So what are the tech implications of mobile money? Um, how has, has Kenya regulated mobile money from a tech perspective? How do you feel about uh, this or this fintech pro- project as a tech expert? I think just in general, there hasn't been uh, much regulation from a tax perspective. So we are still at the point where we are, the debate is, you know, since M-Pesa is provided by Safaricom, which is a, a telco company, 
are we considering M-Pesa a financial service? So should we be applying things like excise duty on it? Or are we just going to, you know, consider it part of the telco business and um just subject it to regular corporate income tax? I think as far as that goes, there hasn't been much progress. Naturally, there has been resistance from telco companies, specifically Safaricom, because they hold the biggest, they, they basically hold the biggest share of the market, about 95%, maybe even more. I'm not quite sure on that, but there's been a lot of resistance from them because naturally categorizing it as a uh, financial MPESA as financial services would expose it to significantly more regulation and obviously an increase in taxes. So right now it would only be the income taxes charged at 30% at the end of every year. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, to ask a question that is based on both your responses. So you both raised this issue of market monopoly by the respective tech companies that are offering these mobile money services, which is very true. But I want to uh, take your attention to something. Don't don't bother yourself about the X, but I'm just going to tell you what the X says, and then I I, I ask you of your opinions with regards to how the market is regulated and how there's so much monopoly, what do you think has to be done? So the the World Trade Organization came up with an agreement which basically is for the regulation of telecom services, right? So it was pretty much meant to liberalize the telecom sector to allow for investment within the sector among all these other issues, right? And you would notice that most African countries were not so keen on being a party or contributing party to that telecom service, um, I can say, agreement. Uh, then, mainly because they were trying to hold on to the monopoly, like they were trying to hold on to the sector so much and protect it. But then, we, we, we now have instances now where in the same African countries, there is still monopoly in the telecom sector, but the, the market is being monopolized by private companies. For instance, in, in Zimbabwe, I would assume that Net One is actually the, 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 a parastatal company and Econet is a private company. So how, how is, how is it working? I mean, this was an industry or a sector, so to say, that was initially protected by the state, specifically meant for parastatals. And now we have got independent companies or private companies coming in to monopolize the same market. What do you think has to happen? And, um, how, how do you feel about it? What has to be done to make sure that there is a equal competition within the market? And then the, if there are new entrants, they're actually given a platform to express themselves within the market. I'll start with you, Hillary. Okay. So <clears throat> in my view, the simple answer to your question is network effects. Every telecoms provider enjoys the benefit of um, having certain machinery in place that allows them to provide a service. So what happens when with with a monopoly like Econ- Econet is that it dominates the market to the point that other other parties can't come in and generate the kind of traction that Econet has. And I'll explain. Econet enjoys a monopoly of over um, over 10 million subscribers in in Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe I think is just under 14 or 15 million people. So it it enjoys a vast majority majority of the subscriber base. Meaning that if you are net one, if you are my cash, if you are telecell, you are competing for a very small piece of the pie. So what happens now is Econet has established itself to the point that the barrier of entry into the market is so high that it's nearly impossible for a new player to come in and gain traction in the market. So network effects, you know, speaks to the ability to to, to reduce prices and price you out of the market. It speaks to, to the infrastructure that's on the ground, which Econet has, which others don't enjoy. It speaks to the ability to source even financing. So there are so many aspects of investment. There are so many aspects of, you know, being a player on the market that are affected by them being so huge 
that can't be replicated by other companies. So yeah, ultimately, I think it comes down to network effects. How big is your subscriber base? Because the more subscribers you have, the more transactions you have, the more money you make. And the less you leave for others to come in and, and you know, compete. So interesting. Over to you, Natasha. I think just, I would mostly agree with Hilary. But I think as an interesting point on how you mentioned that this would be private companies. The interesting bit about Safaricom is that the government of Kenya is one of the biggest shareholders in the company. But as Hillary said, a lot of it is basically the what he calls the network effect. For Safaricom, they have the capacity and the resources to basically price you out of the market. I think just as an example, at some point when um, Airtel was joining the industry and the Kenyan market, I believe Safaricom lowered their prices for making costs to really less than a shilling. And at that point, I believe Airtel was charging four shillings per minute. And of course, people are naturally drawn to the cheaper prices. They also have a bigger network. They have significantly more agents. You could literally be in the middle of nowhere. There will always be an Mpesa agent near you. There will always be a Safaricom branded shop near you as opposed to Airtel and I think Tcash, which is run by Telcom. I think we even have a running joke, like if you have somebody and they've been away for so long and they suddenly come back, they're like, oh, so you're back from looking for that Airtel money agent. Wow. Wow. That that was a a very good one. I, I think the Zimbabwe perspective which is slightly different from the Kenyan perspective when it comes to who owns this telecom company, speaks exactly to the discussion that was ongoing when the WTO members were trying to negotiate this agreement. We have Kenya, which has got uh, Safaricom, basically a private-owned uh, company, but still having the, being the biggest shareholder, basically saying that you know, states are still holding on to the telecom sector because of how worse it is. And then we have in a case of Zimbabwe, we have a totally independent uh, company or tele- or, yeah, company, so to say, running the telecom sector and having monopoly over the market, which basically is exactly what most countries were afraid of initially when they were not taking up this commitment uh, under the WTO. So I, I, I think it's, it's really something that's worth uh, having further discussions on. So I'm going to come back to you know, the challenges, again, not necessarily to dig deeper into the challenges, but to ask this question that based on the challenges that you've identified in in your respective countries, what do you think has to be done? What what are the solutions that should be put in place to make sure that this actually becomes a success? And while you're speaking on that, would you think that um, Africa as a continent can actually be the, you know, the game player when it comes to to exporting uh, mobile money products to other countries or other continents. Bearing it in mind that uh, there is a general perception that African countries or Africans have always been on the receiving end when it comes to digital solutions. We are, the, we, we are considered the biggest market for digital products. So now that we have this mobile money, that is something that is specific to this question, so to say, can you, do you think that if we develop the, the product better, we can start exporting the product? And how do we even get to the point where we say we have, we have, uh, developed the product better given the challenges that you, so I'm going to start with you, Hilary. Okay. Um, I think the number one, uh, solution that can resolve the challenges we face in using mobile money is regulation. Clear, concise regulation um, that is consistent, you know, that allows for planning, that allows for growth and investment in the mobile money sector. I gave you the example of what happened last year where agents were put out of business. And it wasn't for it wasn't arbitrary, it wasn't random in the sense that there was no logic behind it. There was a clear, there was a clear idea of what, what needed to be done. And the 
other BZ's fear was that, you know, the eco cash platform was being used for, for fraud and in, and other illicit uh, financial transactions. So if there's a regulatory framework that's clear and concise, that allows players to know what to expect and to give them the ability to plan, then I think it can, it can, you know, allow the industry to grow in leaps and bounds. Um, then you ask the question that can Africa be an exporter of digital products and in this particular case, mobile money? I, I, I have, I don't know if my answer will be unpopular, but I think mobile money, I don't think we need to export mobile money to, to, to the rest of the world, if that makes sense on a logical basis, and this is the first point I'll make. Uh, like I said before, in the West, you've got 92 to 95% uptake of people with bank accounts. In Africa, you've got 20 to 30%. So that on its own shows you that there's a vast market that can be tapped into insofar as Africa is concerned. So as a fintech product, Mobile money, I believe, can be used to get into markets that we haven't tapped into so far. There's um, agriculture, there's mining. How you can create products that allow farmers to 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 take insurance, you know, to take insurance and grow crops and and be able to borrow money so that they grow crops. So this can be done through mobile fintech, through mobile money, and so on. So I believe that we can grow our own product in Africa. That works for Africa. I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced that mobile money is a solution that works for developed countries. Um, but I do believe that it can be tweaked so that it can, you know, benefit the specific needs of African countries. Wow. That's very interesting. Uh, Natasha, your thoughts? I think I would say for the biggest improvement that would happen for it to make, to make mobile money more comfortable for users would be data protection, especially in the Kenyan context where every now and then, I believe in 2019, we had a case where um, somebody managed to access the M-Pesa database and pulled out data for, I think, 11 million users. That includes their locations, their ID numbers, their telephone numbers, such things. If the data protection was being taken seriously, people would be more comfortable and confident in the quality of service they're using. As far as exporting goes, I think I tend to agree with Hilary. I don't believe we need to be out here exporting mobile money. And I know recently, especially in the West, there's been an uptake of things like Venmo and Cash App which are basically just mobile money platforms. But I believe there's significantly more potential to grow within the continent rather than having it as a thing we are selling to other continents. Can I come in on that? Yes. Yes, yeah, thank you. You raise an important point, Natasha, because you talk of Venmo and Cash App. I think the environment for doing business insofar as financial services are concerned in Africa and in the West are fundamentally different. You find that mobile money is a, uh, is a transactional product, right? You can use it on any phone. You don't have to download an app. But in the West, uh, I tend to see these, these applications or these products being delivered through an application. So you've got transaction-based or value based and then you've got app based products. Um, I, I don't, I don't think we're at that point in Africa that we can support app-based products because of geographical limitations. For example, an app that can be popular in Nigeria can only be popular in Nigeria and not have as much popularity beyond Nigeria in as far as financial services are concerned. So as far as that's concerned, I am convinced that we are good as we are. I think we need to tweak it, make it work for Africa and if the app option comes 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 along down the line, then that's perfectly fine. I think Thank just you so to much also add, yes, yes, this to is Hillary's <laughs> point, <laughs> it's not just a geographical constraint as far as the app technology goes. It's also um, the quality of fonts people are using, because 
while a lot of people in urban areas might be using smartphones, but smartphones are not as popular in rural areas. So if you're going to put it in an app, then how do you intend to target those people? Wow. I I actually never thought about it, you know, from that perspective. And you've given me something to think about it. about. Because if you look at uh, the reasons that you have cited as being the 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 causes for mobile money in in Africa in, in in your respective countries, you'd realize that they all speak to financial inclusion. And I don't think financial inclusion is really a problem when we start looking at developed economies. I would probably think that this might be a solution that could work for other least developed and uh, least developing least least developed countries and other developing economies generally in the world because I, I feel like Especially this uh, issue of financial inclusion is is not really specific to Africa, but it is a problem that faces um, that most developing countries and least developed economies do face. So if then we are looking at probably growing the the market to a to an extent where we probably start exporting, it would necessarily not be to Europe or to the US, but may maybe to those other countries that stay share the same problem that we have here in the continent. I'm going to ask, I mean, we were talking so much about the African continental free trade area. Everybody's so hyped about it. And I would really not be happy if I close this session without talking about it. So, I mean, we constantly hear of how this is a big initiative for the continent, uh, a, a very big market for, for Africa with preferential trade rules, and there are so many benefits that will that are being spoken of. So my question is, where does mobile money fit in this broader picture? Um, how does it help realize the benefits of the African continental free trade area? I know this is just um, more or less like a random question, but I just want to understand how it probably would help with pay with the payment system in the in, in the cross border trading uh, system or supply chain system, if you, if you want to put it that way. So, yeah, your thoughts, if any. Yes, um, I, I believe that mobile money works for the simple reason that it's fintech, it's it's all about financial inclusion, it's all about enhancing banking products, finance products that weren't available to the larger majority of the population before. So you find that uh, payment services even loan services are more accessible to the general public. And this feeds into the greater idea of enhancing trade in Africa, in enhancing or growing economies within the, on the African continent. So I believe the, the, the wider access, the greater access to more people and in turn more money uh, bodes well for economic development. That's very interesting. Natasha, do you have Anything to think? Not really a thought, more like a question. If you're going to have, um, let's say, you had mobile money transactions, I'm assuming you would be able to use, like in my case, I could use M-Pesa to pay a vendor in any part of Africa. I'm wondering how that would work um, in terms of the money found, you know, linkage to banks. I don't know whether that's clear. Like it's just a forming thought in my mind. That's an interesting one. Hillary, do you want to come in? Um, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not sure I'm equipped to answer that particular one. But um, again, I, I always come back to the issue of regulation. So it's going to be a difficult one working out how the currencies, the various currencies across the continent speak to each other in terms of value. Mm-hmm. But as, as a concept, as a concept, I think it works to have an, an, a facility that on your phone that you can use to pay for a product in Nigeria, that you can use to pay for a product in, Rwanda, in Rwanda, Uganda, and so on. It makes sense sort of at a conceptual level. Um, it will ultimately come down to a policy and regulation question. How do they then marry all of these um, these currencies together without actually having a single currency across Africa? Maybe they'll do that. We don't know. But I think it can be done, but it takes everyone to be on board. Um, but I do believe it can be done. 
uh, yeah, maybe to just give my my own perspective, I do agree with you, Hilary, that it can be done because I'm reminded of um, the money transfer facility um, that we normally use. You know, we're talking about Mukuru, how you can send money via Mukuru and you send it to anyone anyway and they get a, a specific currency. So like you said, it comes back to having a policy framework that actually works and also the rules that govern the cross-border transactions. Uh, I actually realized that in, in, in South Africa here, there are some people who were eco-cash agents. I, I was not aware of that, and I, I don't know the, the legal consequences of that, but it was actually happening where you could go to an agent, an eco-cash agent, you give them South African rands, and then they send money to somebody who is in Zimbabwe. Like if it was a proper eco-cash transaction. So I feel like it, it, it's doable. We just need to have a, a proper framework for that and to ensure that there is interoperability between the these um, fintech solutions. Because I mean, if we could, if the world could could evolve to a point where you can now instantly transfer money from from Africa to somebody who is in Europe, it's doable because it's it's still another channel of transferring money. But again, it's something that has to be well thought. And we also then look at the 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 disparities that exist when we look at African currencies, right? We have got the Zimbabwean currency and we have the South African rand that is slightly stronger. So how then is that going to to play out on the on the exchange market? So those are the things that people need to really think about. And I feel like if we get to a point where we actually develop the products to that extent, it becomes even more easier to realize the objectives of the African continental free trade area. Because, I mean, even the most people who take part in, cro- in informal sport trading that make, that form part of the, the, the bulk of traders in Africa will be financially included. So you can send your products to, to somebody in, in, in Nigeria and then they pay you via, you know, mobile money. You would have sent, um, probably a digital book. So it becomes easier to actually trade and realize the benefits of the African continent of UK area. So I feel like if the, the, the innovators are listening to this, this is something that they might actually want to think about. That's a very good uh, consideration, Natasha. And Hillary, I loved your, your, your response on that. So yeah, I think we're running out of time. So I'm just going to ask you guys to give your final uh, thoughts. If you are going to be remembered for having been part of this conversation, uh, on, on mobile money. What is it that you want people to remember you for, for? Any, any recommendations, be it from, uh, from a policy perspective or a regulatory perspective or from a practical perspective, whatever that you want to be remembered for. This is now the time to say it. Yeah. Hilary. <laughs> the pressure. Well, before I, I go into that, um, I, I'd like to answer a question that, uh, I didn't get to answer earlier about taxation of uh, mobile money transactions. Um, Natasha, you know, uh, gave her view. But in Zimbabwe, there's a tax called uh, intermedi- Intermediated Money Transfer Tax, IMTT. So in, in terms of this tax, uh, there is a mandatory 2%, per- 2% fee on every transaction that you do. So every mobile money transaction, save for a select few, uh, is charged at 2% of the value of that transaction. And for the tax people out there, uh, this is charged over and above VAT, which in essence means that there is double taxation going on. So that's why I keep on harping about regulation. These things need to be ironed out so that the ordinary consumer isn't burdened by all of this. People really don't care or don't factor in that they're paying tax when they're, when they're transacting. They just want to transact, do what they do, and move on with life. So I would suggest, I would recommend rather that the policy and regulatory framework around mobile money be fluid, be concise, be clear, and above all, be fair to the consumer at the end of the day, because they are the ones who rely on these products to 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 receive salaries, to receive wages, and so on. It's critically important, in my view, that the regulatory aspects of uh, mobile money be ironed out as soon as possible to allow for the growth of the industry. 
So, yeah, I think having said that, <laughs> those will be my parting remarks, Chief. Wow, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Hilary. Uh, Natasha? Those are such good thoughts by Hilary. <laughs> I think for me, I would say I would like for the costs to be significantly cheaper. Same as Hilary. If I have to, you know, debate between, oh, which one is cheaper? Do I just do a bank to M-Pesa transaction or just an M-Pesa to M-Pesa transaction and the bank to M-Pesa is cheaper? Then I'm obviously going to, you know, gravitate towards that. So naturally, I would like the costs to be significantly cheaper, but I would also like to know that the data I have voluntarily provided to them cannot just be accessed by any random person with a bit of IT knowledge and a laptop. So I would like for my data to be protected and I would like for my mobile money costs to be significantly cheaper. I think that's it for me. Wow, thank you so much for, for raising that. The whole issue uh, on data protection you know, it's a very hectic one. It gets me very emotional, especially when I start going down that road. I hope we have another webinar on that we will talk about that in, in great detail. So thank you guys for joining us. I just wanted to close by saying, so this is what I experienced in Zimbabwe. When when we got to a point where cash was source cast, you know, the, the agents would inflate the prices and add on a markup and it just became, so even the transactional cost that Natasha is speaking of became exceedingly higher. You needed to get cash for some of these other things that you couldn't do with mobile money, uh, like getting a taxi and all these other things. So it became so much of a burden on the very person that, you know, when this project was first thought of, was being, was trying to be protected, was being protected. So I think that it's good for financial inclusion, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to work when it's the only option that's available. There need to be cash to actually support the product, to make it work, to make it efficient, to make it better. We can start talking about cost reductions. Yes, at a later stage, if we have to make sure that people are using it not out of uh, desperation, but because they do have a choice. And I really appreciate what Mobile Money has done in the continent to try and uh, financially includes a lot of people. I've seen that happen in Zimbabwe and that was a beautiful thing. We also had the, the platforms, if, I'm, I'm talking about EcoCash being linked to Stuart Bank, which ended up have, uh, contributing to a lot of people opening up, you know, their bank accounts and all this other thing. So that was a very great in, uh, initiative. Thank you guys for coming in and sharing you know, your insights. Yes. I think before we wrap up, I just have a quick question. Um, cause I haven't had this being mentioned, but in Zimbabwe, how does it work if you're going to make a mobile money payment to a vendor? Hilary, please. Okay. I want to be sure I understand your question. You are asking essentially the, the same question Chido asked you at the beginning of, of the podcast. So how it, how it works. Yes. Okay. So I, I like background. Mobile money is supported by telecoms providers. And to provide the service, they need the backing of a bank, right? And which is why the, the, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe has regulated authority over mobile money transaction, um, operators. So what happens is when you, when you want to buy something, for example, you go to a vendor and you type in a USD, USSD code, uh, like star, uh, 151 hash on whatever the case may be, according to your network. And then their name comes up and then they verify that it's them because you're speaking to them. You're face to face. You verify that it's them. And then you, you, you type in your pin. You type in the amount of money that you want to pay. And then that's that. You, you, you use this service in shops. You use it. You could even use it to buy fuel. You could use it to buy anything and everything. So that's basically how it works. You, you rock up with your phone. You enter the USSD code. Um, you enter your PIN, the amount you want to transact, and then you pay. And then you get an SMS notification showing you that you paid, who you've paid it to, the reference number for the transaction, as well as the remaining balance on your, on your, on your mobile money account. Oh, so it's exactly the same as in Kenya then? It would seem so. Okay, guys. 
thank you so much for tuning in to into today's discussion. It was very interesting having to hear what Hillary had to say about mobile money in Zimbabwe and Natasha also speaking on the same issues, but we, uh, from a Kenyan perspective. Uh, we, we would really welcome your feedback. Any questions, any thoughts that you, you might have for us or the panelists, please let them come through our various uh, platforms. Thank you so much for tuning in. We we'll hope to meet again next week having another discussion. Bye for now. Wow.